Ajay, you can start the recording. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to this uh, seminar today. And so to today we have Professor uh, Sunaina Dhingra with us, and uh, the theme for the talk today is transitioning to an obese India. It's a very interesting topic, and she'll be detailing it more uh, with respect to demographic and structural determinants of the rapid rise in overweight incidence. So uh, before we get into, uh, we have Professor, uh, we have uh, the, our Dean with us. So do you want to start something like introduce something and then we can get on a few words from you and- then... uh, That's all right, yeah. yeah. Except, um, you know, since we are scheduling this on a Wednesday afternoon and in our timetable, we don't really have teaching. Yeah. I would would have been happier if more faculty had yeah. joined um, because that's the whole point of keeping one part of a week um, free. Uh, yeah. And that doesn't mean, you know, no other academic obligations. So, so I'd like you to convey this to um, our faculty uh, or I'll do it myself since I'm here. Um, you know, that, um, you know, see, we, we need to um, support one another, um, listen to the work and uh, of our, our colleagues and what they've done and, uh, and you know, give feedback, provide uh, appreciation, also constructive comments. So it is an, uh, an obligation. So it's not um, that, you know, um, if I feel like it, I'll do it. So I've got to convey this to our faculty. Um, so, but, you know, nonetheless, um, I'm grateful that uh, those who are um, here are here, and I just want to thank um, all of those who are here, um, and we look forward to Sunaina's uh, presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. Thanks. Thanks, Geeta. Well, so, I'll just turn my video off, Geeta, but I'll on, turn it on once I'm done with my Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm sharing my screen, and I start. Yeah, it's visible. Okay. Yes, yeah. perfect. So good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much, everybody who all are here. So um, today, I'm actually going to talk about a paper that just recently got published uh, in the Journal of Economics and Human Biology, which was actually I co-authored with my ex uh, uh, boss, come supervisor and colleague, Anaka Ayer and Professor Prabhu Bengali from Tata Cornell Institute. Um, and uh, this the idea of this paper actually came from the huge trend of rising adult overweight and obesity incidents in India in the last decades. So if we see an additional 280 million people in India have been at risk of poor obesity. And if I convert it to the population of India, it's 99% of the adult population of America that's obese if it's were in India. So, and not just that, they are at risk of obese. We also have something called obesity-related obesity non-communicable diseases um, that are that will be obviously higher in people who would be at risk of obesity. And when we saw this trend coming from the NFHS4 data, we thought it would be a useful exercise to model the phenomena and identify the factors that have been influencing this rise in the obesity in our country. So mainly obesity studies or overweight studies have been done mainly for developed countries like US, Canada. Very little have been done for India and particularly we do not have that much data, but we were fortunate that NFHS4 and now I'm waiting for NFHS5 to update my study and see where we are heading towards. So I will uh, start. So this graph is basically telling us what is happening in India. This graph, I'll explain it a bit quickly. The, graph is giving us the distribution of BMI, body mass index, by group, so by rural, urban, as well as by gender. So the red lines that you see in the graphs, they are basically the cutoffs for BMI at which we classify individuals as overweight, underweight, or obese. Uh, so 18.5 and below is underweight, 25 is a global accepted cutoff for overweight, and 30 is the cutoff for obese. So people above 30 BMI are obese, people above 25 are overweight and under 18.5 are un um, underweight, um, uh, above 25 are overweight and between 18.5 and 25 are normal. 
Now, the solid lines that you see, the pink and the blue, are for round three, which was 2005 and 6 FNFHS. And the dashed line are for round four, which is 2015-16. So they, the data is 10 years apart. And the pink I have denoted the women and the blue is for men. So I'll quickly explain the graph. There are two things that are coming and I'll start with the good news. So it's always good to start with good things. The good thing is that if we look at the um, underweight incidence among adult population, it has gone down drastically in India across the board for rural India and urban India. And that by what I mean is that if I look at the extreme left red line in each panel, the 18.5 for underweight, the mass of the distribution has declined across men, women, rural, urban. However, this is not the idea of the paper. It's good that it's gone down. What we are interested specifically is in the phenomenal increase in overweight and obesity. And what we can see from the graph is that the graph, the dashed line, which is the second round, the fourth round, the this, the time after 10 years, we see there's a rightward shift in the distribution across, again, for men, women. That means there's a greater mass for, from the increase in the prevalence of people in the cutoff 25 and 30. So overweight has gone up drastically. So what is the issue? The, then why should we care so much about this increase? So what I mean is, maybe this is just a part of our population level experience. We still have only 20% people who are obese. And it is just that we can say, okay, obesity is going up in our country. But there are a few things, some, some flags that I need to highlight that why we need to study this even at such lower levels is because number one, it has been established by the WHO that Asians are more predisposed to NCD, non-communicable diseases and mortality risk at lower BMI compared to Caucasians. So basically, we are taking a global, like we are being conservative because we want our paper, we wanted our paper to be comparable with other studies which are for developed countries. But the cutoff of 25 is actually a more conservative measure. WHO says that Indians and Asians specifically, and India being a part, are more predisposed that they have higher risk even at a cutoff of 23. So these issues of having non-communicable diseases at a BMI of 23 are much higher for Indians than compared to whites. And, and we all know that like we, most of us have experienced the health system in India, it's good, but it is not the best and it is not the greatest. And what we also know is that we, most of the time we go to private healthcare system, which is often unaffordable. And if I go to the current statistics about the percentage of people, adult people dying, it is 62% of the deaths in adult population is due to non-communicable diseases. So this shows that there's a huge burden that is heading our way. And if we do not control this problem of obesity and therefore consequentially non-communicable diseases, India would be having a very high mortality rate among adults. And as is with more developed countries, um, what we are also seeing and that I'll highlight in a moment is that obesity is eventually becoming a problem of a poor. Initially, we say it's the problem of the rich, but now, as we have seen in developed countries, that's the learning that we have, and we already are seeing it in India also, that it, the burden is now falling on the poor. So that is what makes me you know, more inclined toward the study that we need to do something about this rising overweight, despite undernutrition being one of the primary healthcare problems that India faces. Now, what does this graph display? It it, this displays the overweight. I'm using the conservative BMI 25 and above is considered to be overweight or obese. I also do my tests for uh, BMI greater than 23 considered to be overweight or obese and my results are robust. I'll speak about that later. But this is telling me the percentage of people who are adult people, I'm considering 18 to 49, a men and women who are, who are overweight in year 2005, 6 and 2015, 16. So the lighter color is the fourth round in NFHS 4, the recent one, and the darker gray is the 2000 and NFHS 3 round. And from this, we see that, okay, it's coming out that urban female has the highest incidence level and they are, so overweight is actually a problem of the urban female. But when we look slightly deeper and look at this graph, which looks at the changes over time, we see that urban women are actually showing the least increase in the overweight prevalence from 2005, 6 to 15, 16. So over a period of 10 years, we see two very important and startling results from this simple 
display of summary statistic is that one, we do not have urban problem that much. The entire increase or most of the increase in overweight prevalence, the decadal increase has come from rural areas. And even more stalking is that it's coming from male overweight prevalence. So it's the male, rural male increase in overweight incidence, which is driving the entire decadal increase. So this, this, these, diff these differences across, uh, across regions, rural and urban, as well as across gender, because of these differences, we can't just model overweight as a countrywide phenomena, just as we cannot model stunting as a one country problem. We, know, we need to go into district, region specific, and so and so and so forth. But for overweight, we also need to have a gender angle along with the region angle. So we cannot basically model everything as one, one countrywide phenomenon. It may vary our ability to identify groups which are at risk. And if we are unable to avoid groups which are at risk, we won't be able to consequentially identify groups which are more prone to overweight related non-communicable diseases. So what we are doing in this paper, first is that most of the literature is for the developed countries. So first thing is we, we try to link the nutrition transition phenomena. I'll explain more on, on that in a bit. I, we try to link that nutrition transition phenomena with biological obesogenic and environmental factors. I'm going to expand on my conceptual model in a moment, but more importantly, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to be showing you what predicts risk in India and provide insights why intra-country differences in overweight patterns have emerged over time in India. What are the factors that is causing these regional gaps, these gender gaps, and what, what are the policy implications? So now what I do is I summarize my conceptual model. I go quite deeper into it. And I will um, summarize the within country as well as gender differences in the overweight prevalence. So I, I talk about two kinds of theories. One is the nutrition transition theory that's proposed by Popkin. So this transition theory, basically Popkin, we try to link that with other kind of factors that could be causing gender differences. So what does Popkin suggest? Popkin says that during a country's nutrition transition, so nutrition transition means that you're moving from undernutrition to overnutrition. So, so Popkin says that when a country is going this transformation, the risk of obesity declines among the richer population and increases among the poor populations. This is exactly what I'm trying to show you that it's happening in India as well. Though Popkin's arguments are mainly based on developed countries that Poorer people are now likely to be more obese compared to the probability of them getting obese is higher than the probability of a rich person getting obese. Now, why is this happening? It's simple, the transition from labor intensive agricultural work to non-agricultural employment during economic growth reduces their energy expenditure of the work effort. And at the same time, the wages are rises, the female labor force participation is going up, opportunity cost to women time for home production is going up. When all this gets combined with easier access to cheap and processed food, intake of energy dense food increases. But the calorie expenditure of the individuals are decreasing because we have also have motorized uh, transportation, less physical activity required for doing da daily, daily chores. So these two type of factors, one, we have higher income affordability as well as access, as well as a supply of nutrition, um, calorie dense food. And on the other hand, we also have lesser expenditure being done the two factors reinforce each other and what happens is overweight incidence goes up. Now the rich people are able to ameliorate these effects by obviously improving their diet diversity. They go on to better quality nutrition goods, maybe lower on calorie, but maybe expensive and also increasing their physical activity might be like, you know, going out for workouts, going to gym, whereas poor may not be doing that. They might be watching television because for them that could be the leisure. So when there is a change during economic development, during the structural transformation of the country, the nutrition transformation happens side by side. So this is what Popkins proposes, that it's automatic that you will see as economic development will happen, there is going to be a shift in the socioeconomic status gradient. Earlier, it was the rich who were obese. Now it's the poor who will feel the burden. So latest, the Swinburne et al. model came in. The Swinburne et al. model um, basically said that they extended the, the nutrition transition by Popkin and they said that along with this economic development, there are a few things like obesogenic environment, which consists of biological factors like genetics, 
health and other cultural and transportation factors within the country that can also contribute to this differentiated overweight incidence. So, so Swinburne was actually the first one to say, okay, there would be economic development, but there would be regional differences and within country differences, which we need to model. And they did propose that there, there's a need for obesogenic environment that we need to take care of. We propose that in addition to the factors which Popkin and Swinburne et al. has proposed, we need to also take into account the factors, the within country differences that may arise due to biological differences and intra-household differences in obesogenic technologies and obesogenic behaviors that also vary by regional development. What I mean is that there would be differences not just by regions, rural and urban, within rural and urban also, we would have intra-household discrimination and therefore intra-household differences in access to technologies, behaviors, which will cause gender differences in the obesity incidence. So this is, this is the angle that we try to bring. So what I'm gonna do is now talk about each of the stressors, talk about how they behave in the nutrition transition, one being a lower, lower development, second being an upper develop a higher development, and then the gender difference angle. So, so, we, so biological factors has already been included by Swinburne et al, but we add something to them. We say that along with age, it's also the reproductive stress that matters. So the literature on fertility shows that a relationship between diminishing fertility and increase in BMI. So as a woman tends to produce less the number of kids, she's likely to be more healthier and therefore her BMI is going to be healthy. When women first fertility is incomplete, so when they're young, they have shorter lengths of birth spacing, for example, between children, they have a higher reproductive stress. And as a result, their BMI will be poor. Second factor is age. So if we see in developed countries, women tend to be more vulnerable to the negative effects of age-related BMI. Why? Because they have other, other health issues and the adipose tissue conversion into fats is much greater for older women than compared to younger women. Their activity level goes down and so on and so forth. What they've also found in developed countries that the mortality risk among obese middle-aged women of 40 to 60 years are also higher than any other comparable age healthy cohort. So what happens is in the early stages of nutrition transition, for example, when we look at India, and when I say early stages of nutrition, nutrition transition, I mean rural areas because they are the later ones. They are now experiencing the structural transformation. Urban India has already got that structural transformation. So when, when, the, when the structural transformation is at the early stages, it means when development and the demographic transition is also in the early stages, fertility levels are high and the population share is skewed towards a younger population. So in these population, the reproductive stress is high, hence lower overweight incidence. So that is why, why initially rural India had lower overweight incidence because there was a higher reproductive stress in rural India. However, as they move to a later stage of nutritional transformation and structural transformation, that means when your fertility levels are declining or complete, there could be increasing risk for obesity because there would be an increasing BMI also. So when the nutrition transition is complete, fertility is low and demographic dividend disappears. So this increase in demographic related risk for overweight incidence among older population will also go up. For men, however, if I look at the gender differences in this biological factor, which is age and, and fertility, I do not, I, we, we do not, because of differences in physiology between males and females, we do not expect reproductive stresses to be a factor for males. However, Age is a very important factor that can impact male overweight incidence through its relationship with nutritional intake and physical activity. The second factor that is very much talked about in the literature is, um, is obesogenic, uh, in, obesogenic factors. Now, what we do is that we, de we divide this obesogenic factors into actually two groups. One is obesogenic environment or technology, and the second is obesogenic behavior. The literature basically talks about the technology part, which is right now on the screen, which says that basically it is the effects of access to leisure enhancing technologies, which is found within the household, that obviously increases your propensity for obesity. So this is the one that is, has been emphasized in the literature. In early stages of nutritional transition, when development is low and wages are rising, 
the opportunity cost of the ledgers are very high. Individual will choose to consume technologies that will enhance their ability to rest. For example, watching television. Ledger is coming at a premium. Similarly, purchasing of motorized vehicles like bike or construction of piped water within the household rather than walking to the tap that's it's a kilometer or two kilometers away. So these little things will add on to their relaxing capabilities. Whereas for the rich, this is already in place. They already have televisions. They already have motorized vehicles like cars. They already have uh, piped water at home. If, if I talk about urban areas, this won't make that much sense. But for, for rich people, it could be that they would be rather putting their money to gyms and kind of or going to leisurely activities that would require expenditure, maybe, you know, uh, engaging in a better or high nutritional but low calorie food, going out and eating out. So all of this does make a difference in on the on the obesogenic side. Now, so what I mean to say is that when when we are at the early stages of nutrition transition, leisure is a premium. But at later stages of nutrition, nutrition transition, leisure is no longer at a premium. They, the individuals in later stages will direct their time towards technology such as exercise machines, which can increase their health. So now comes the angle of gender. If there are intra-household differences in accessing leisure technologies, automatically it will also contribute to differences in overweight rates by gender. So for example, time-saving home technologies like piped drinking water, washing machines, vacuum cleaner, they are more likely to reduce the calorie expenditure of women, right? Since women are largely related to these tasks. However, for men, it could be more access to things like motorized vehicles. So access to motorized vehicles and cars is likely to reduce, or uh, sorry, likely to increase the overweight incidence among men, whereas washing machines or pipe drinking water is likely to increase overweight incidence in women. These intra-household disparities in access to goods and services are known to have a nutritional impact on outcomes of women more adversely. So the second factor that I, that I will talk about in obesogenic, I've already talked about technologies, that male and female might have different access to technologies. We also have something called differences in behaviors. Now, what, when I say obesogenic behaviors, they include individuals' behavior that are associated with sedentary lifestyles. For example, uh, watching television, smoking, alcohol, consuming fatty foods. These are not technologies, but they are rather, they are basically the activities or the behavior that individuals involve themselves or engage themselves. So these factors showcase that individual will exhibit, exhibit bias and thus engage in unhealthy behaviors. And if they're engaging in unhealthy behaviors, their likelihood of being overweight will be much higher. Now, what happens is that in early stages of nutrition transition, when nutrition transition is just beginning, individuals have a leisure at a high premium. They might prefer spending time watching television or consuming more addictive foods rather than spending time exercising. Whereas at later stages of nutrition transition, the same individual may prefer to invest more time on health production. So these factors are very important in also modeling any overweight, in, um, overweight incidence. Access to tobacco, alcohol in India, this varies by gender considerably and also by level of economic development. So for example, if I look at um, smoking, I know when from looking at data from NFHS 3 and 4, smoking has gone down. Now it's been very well established that when a person is smoking, the person is likely to be under, be, is not likely to be overweight. But once the person stops smoking, then the chances of getting overweight are much higher than a person who was not smoking. So, so we might have smoking killing appetite during the time when you are actually smoking, but if smoking is curtailed, your BMI is likely to go up and hence you're more prone to obesity or a higher overweight incidence. Another thing is uh, diet diversity. So we all know that <clears throat> if we have a very uh, high um, diet that is very high on calories, we are likely to be overweight. But now with nutrition transition as more access of better quality nutrients, better quality diets, non-staples being available, what is happening is that people are diversifying. Now, when people diversify, they are able to bring down the calorie intake down and are able to have a more balanced diet. Now, a more diversified diet is more or less always linked to a better health status. 
For India, we do not still see that much, especially for manufacturers, because we do not have data on calories. But I do try to bring in some kind of dietary diversity uh, variable in my model so that I can model how does that affect the obesity indicator. So that is that comes in obesogenic behaviors. The next, next would be SCS. I've already stressed enough on it about the Popkin theory, which says that initially the rich people are the ones who will be likely to be overweight, but at later stages of structural transformation and nutrition transformation, what happens is rich tend to spend their time more on health related activities. Therefore, they are likely to be less overweight. Now, we also have other uh, variables like caste and religion uh, and education that also come be a part of socioeconomic status. Caste and religion are very similar to race variable in developed countries. They capture structural differences that can lead to socioeconomic disparities in health outcomes, which is commonly seen in developed countries like India. And in India, we have uh, cultural differences also and differences in dietary habits also uh, with caste. So groups that are in lower a socioeconomic status group also have lower access to food and greater food insecurity. So there are a variety of things that get entangled in the socioeconomic status variable. We try to capture by looking at wealth, education, caste, and religion separately. And there is also an angle of intra-household again to this because even if the household is rich, if there may be differences in the access to income by gender, which will influence the socioeconomic status gradient. At lower levels of income, women face higher constraints in access to food. When the economic constraint eases, they may likely to see an increase in overweight incidence. For richer women, lower intra-household inequality may protect them from this gradient. Better access to information and options to partake their own health investments may protect them from overweight incidence risk that may arise from higher socioeconomic status group. And the next very important variable that has not been really taken into account is the the health environment which in which the individual is situated. So we propose that we also need to take into account the meso and mac macro level uh, factors uh, because these factors can affect the overweight incidence to quite an extent. In our paper, we see that a quite significant percent has been coming from the meso level factors. By meso level factor, I mean cluster wise impacts of development influence. So, for example, the availability of public infrastructure to engage in exercise can help reduce overweight rates. For, so for example, if a village has a, has a park gym, for example, so the people, they are more likely to use it. So we need to control for this and take into account about these public infrastructure that is available. And most of my policy implications are also following that what kind of infrastructure we need since the problem of overweight and obesity is coming now on rural people who are also not likely to have gyms and other, um, other way, ways to engage in um, higher physical activities. What are the ways by which they can actually curtail or have a higher um, calorie expenditure? So we need to also control for the cluster level overweight uh, attributes. Now, in many less developed countries, being overweight is also considered to be a physically act attractive traits. So if, if I remember in at least kids, if I used to ask the mother of the child, how, what do you think is your child healthy? Um, the size of the child, small, medium or large? She would never say, oh, my child is large. She would always say, no, my bacha is always small. So there is a tendency of Indian and especially in, uh, low, um, uh, in lower developed regions to keep you know, being overweight is considered to be attractive. And when then they don't want to be vocal about it because then they say okay it's gonna, it can be a bad sign if people will you know it's not a nice thing if people get to know that I feel my kid is very healthy so in that case whereas in developed countries or even for developed uh, urban regions you can see that the 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 idea of reducing weight is way high so overweight is considered to be a negative trait so we need to take into account these community level variables or uh, predictors so what we do is that we construct a variable called cluster level overweight prevalence and we use that in our analysis when i show my um, my uh, variables i'll talk more about this variable but the meso environment means the, the physical infrastructure or the health infrastructure that you have i am not able to take into account gyms prevalence or a physical other physical activity because there's unavailability of data but that is exactly what i want to go in my quality of health and environmental infrastructure 
Then we also uh, uh, control for macro level indicators. For example, state, the, play, the state in which the individual resides. Now, what we know is that in India, there is a transformation happening and states are quite diversified. So what we do is we take a model of uh, uh, an already developed model uh, which classifies states as per the level of their structural transformation into lagging states, highly productive in agricultural states, urbanizing states, and rapidly transforming states. And we use that state classification to, to control for the, for the state effects, particularly in a model. And lastly, uh, there are other factors which I would highlight we do not control for and we particularly cannot because we do not have data, but they are very important. For example, intrinsic health, mental health, genetics, these conditions can slow down metabolism, reduce energy to do, to do physical activity, and hence risk, uh, increase the risk for overweight incidence. Um, women, for example, are also not able to convert excess calorie into lean muscles as efficiently as men. So they are also therefore more likely to gain weight. So the only thing we have is we run these uh, uh, our analysis separately for men and women to control for all those factors that could be different for men and women. However, there is a data caveat that I would like to highlight that there are some fa factors that should very much be in our model, but we cannot really model it. So uh, coming to the data, uh, we empirically model this rising overweight using the two rounds of National Family Health Survey, the two recent third and fourth, first and second do not collect data on men and women, hence I cannot do that analysis. Uh, this is a nationally representative multi-year so there are four till now, fifth is almost out. The data is not yet out, but reports are out. Cross-sectional data set with information on height, weight, on over more than 800,000 men and women between the ages of 18 to 49. And um, what we are also doing is something novel about our papers is that we are using constructed BMI. At times, most of the papers from developed countries report, you know, when they ask the women, what do you think your health is? Are you healthy? Are you obese? Are you over it? It's, it's a revealed kind of a thing from the respondent. It's not a calculated. We use height and weight and calculate a BMI indicator and therefore use the cutoff to call them overweight or underweight or obese. And then using the OHAKA blinder decomposition method, we identify the most important factors that will basically explain this increasing overweight incidence in India or the intra-country differences in the nutrition transition in India. So broadly, we have these biological factors, obesogenic factors, socioeconomic status, mesoenvironment, macroenvironment. Um, I'm using age, reproductive stress for biological. In reproductive stress, I have marriage, number of children, completed fertility. I just want to highlight two ones because they, they are the ones I'm going to be highlighting way more than my results. And in obesogenic factors, I make a differentiation between obesogenic technology and obesogenic behaviors. And what we will show is that there are differences between men and women in each of these factors. What we cannot control for is genetic, psychological stresses and increasing health. So for OHAKA, as Komal did OHAKA blinder quite in detail, I'm not gonna get into the method, but as a first stage, I'm doing a linear probability model uh, where I run the probability of being overweight on a set of covariates. Now, this model will be basically no, it's not giving me any different results than logit and COVID. And therefore, for the ease of interpretation in OHAKA, I use LPM. For OHAKA blinder, I'm just going to give a brief up. What it does is basically it takes the two overweight prevalence in the two rounds in our example, 2005 and 6 and 2015 and 16, take the difference, the change that has happened in this overweight prevalence and decompose into two effects. So one, so utilizing this OHAKA blinder decomposition, we are explaining it into two parts. One, the portion that explain the differences that arise from changes in the distribution of the predictors of adult nutrition. For example, how does the distribution of, of income, how does the distribution of obesogenic factors, how does the distribution of reproductive stress has changed? And how does that change affect the change in, in overweight prevalence? And the second, which is the unexplained effect or the coefficient effect is the Contribution of each, what is the effect of each of this factor that I'm taking on, or what is the relationship, the change in the relationship between the, the risk factors and their coefficients on obesity. So basically I'm taking the beta coefficients in round three and round four and looking at the change in those beta coefficients. Coming directly to the results. Now, what we see is that 
Um, first of all, the most important thing is that if we look at the third row, which is the total change, we see that for women, rural women, there has been a 6.8 percentage points um, increase in ovate prevalence for rural women. For rural men, it has been 8%. For urban women, it has been 6.4 percentage points, whereas for rural urban men, it's 9.4. Now, this is the total change in percentage points that we see in ovate prevalence. From the next row, which is the explained contribution, what we see is that the covariates that we have chosen in the model, the, the age, the reproductive stress, the obesogenic factors, the macro and meso environment, all of that together explain a large portion of the change. That means the way they have changed between the two rounds, the way income has changed between two rounds, the way obesogenic technologies have changed between the distribution of these factors have changed in these two rounds, they explain a large portion of my increase in overweight problems. In fact, in many cases, it explains more than 100%. As I can see from the graph, that my red and blue bars that basically represent men and women, the change that has been explained, we see almost 100% in rural and urban is being explained by the factors I take. A very small proportion, and as we can see from the negative coefficients of unexplained, is unexplained. That means my beta coefficients do not explain much. It is the change in the distribution. That means people have gone maybe more rich. People are maybe watching more television, and that is the reason. We exactly pinpoint these factors, and try to say. So the unexplained changes, the one that is in the last row or the bottom bars, that is the change in the relative contributions of each factor do not play a, as important a role, but the explained contribution plays a very important role. Just a quick point, how I'm constructing my percentages that I am dividing this explained numbers divided by the total change. So 8.7 by 6.8, that's how I'm going to construct my explained percentage or, or my unexplained percentages. Going on to what exactly is causing for men and women and where are these differences in rural and urban, that's where we go for the disaggregate con con contribution where we look at each of the factors. So what we do is we calculate the total contribution of each of the stressors that we are taking for each group. What we see is that age, if you can look at the age, the age matters more for women. 4.4 and 11.8 for women, but for men, it's very low. Reproductive stress or across, we have only for rural women. We do not see any significant numbers for urban male or female, as well as from rural men. So basically, clearly rural men and rural men do not have any reproductive stress as a key factor explaining their overweight, neither do urban men. And also urban women. For urban women, we see a huge proportion is coming from the age factor. That means it is the um, growing women age that is basically causing them to be at a higher risk of being overweight. So there are something related to the age and this is increasing over time, which means that as a woman is getting older, the probability of her being overweight is gonna be much higher compared to when she was in 2005 than being 2015-16. Coming to obesogenic factors, now right now I've combined obesogenic factors, both technologies and environment, I see that huge percentage of, of the change in the ovate has been explained by obesogenic factor and SES together. But we do see gender differences. For females, we see that obesogenic factors matter more, uh, sorry, uh, obesogenic factors matter less compared to socioeconomic status, whereas for men, it is the obesogenic factors that matter more than socioeconomic status. So this, there are some differences that we see for rural as well as for urban men. We see the same thing for meso environment. So this is the classic um, um, omitted variable that you can say that was not taken into account, which is the cluster level prevalence of, of being overweight. 82 point eight, it's ranging somewhere between 80%. So whatever increase has been happened, it has happened because of the increasing proportion of community level of prevalence of OVA. Now this is basically capturing community level, level development indicators. So we did also a close check. We, we try to look at the correlation between this community prevalence with other community level development indicators. And we saw there was a huge high, um, high uh, correlation. So we propose that it supports our argument that SES factors at the local level proxied by community variable is very important for our 
explaining the overweight incidence. And lastly, we also have state of residence is basically combining um, different uh, kind of uh, states like low agriculture performing, high agriculture performing. It's right now combined, so we can't really see the difference. I have not shown it here, but we do have in our paper differences by different level of structural transformation of states. So even in the graph, I've just kind of converted them, uh, um, displayed the entire result of the table on the graph. We can see the meso environment is quite high and it's quite equal in all the four categories, rural men, women, and urban men and women. But we do see differences in age, for example, reproductive, obesogenic factors, and socioeconomic status. The next thing which is very important for us to highlight was the differences in in the, um, the factors that really matter for men and women. For example, I said that biological factors matter for rural men, uh, women and uh, urban women, but not for men. So it's clearly when I kind of do a dis, so this was a aggregated one. This is a disaggregated one. What we see was that it was the woman who was looking at, was having a very high percentage, see five, 11, whereas men had a very small percentage coming from age. So, so age was not a problem for men. Neither was reproductive stress. It was mainly for rural female we saw reproductive stress, not even urban, urban female. The next important was the breakup between obesogenic factors. We see that smoking was more for rural men and women, uh, sorry, rural and urban men, not for women. Diet diversity mattered only for women, and this is possibly because we have a very crude indicator of, of diet, which is anyway not, but we have only a significant for rural India, which shows that at lower stages of development, diet is getting diversified, but at a different level. So there are likely chance of increasing BMI because it is a lower stage of development. Coming to obesogenic factors, one very important difference is that it is leisure, which is like watching television, is in increasing the overweight incidence across men and women, across rural and urban, but more so in rural India. But transportation is doing more for urban and rural men. So it is basically the intra-household differences in the access to technologies. TV is not excludable, hence both men and women are trying, are, are gaining or likely are gaining weight or having a higher incidence of weight. But if we com compare cars and motorbikes, it is the male um, access that is leading to a higher, a way higher increase in their overweight incidence and automatic. So this this, this kind of this, uh, differentiation explains what is explaining the, the differential access, gender access in the households. And that is how the policy making needs to be taken care of. What kind of policy should be coming out for males, for females, and what kind of actions need, needs to be taken. So uh, this is the unexplained effect. Again, we, we saw that we had a very small un unexplained effect, however, I do want to highlight that that small is actually a combination of both of a lot of positive and negatives. And we see a huge interceptor. So basically it means that we have a lot of factors that we're not including in the model, like intrinsic health, role of genetics that do explain, but get nullified because of other factors. We can't really interpret unexplained effect more than that, but this is the kind of, um, uh, this is the kind of um, explanation we can give for this coefficient effect, which although small in aggregate is important when we look at the disaggregate terms. And next thing is that we also did something called a quantile decomposition is that maybe that just looking at averages or maybe just looking at the, the because we're looking at only overweight prevalence, that means the BMI is above 25, we might be missing out what is happening on other parts of the distribution. So what we do is we do a quantile also to check if our results are robust and we see that it is the covariate effect that explains the factor effect, the improvement in the distribution of the factors that explain overweight or BMI that is causing the entire change and in increase in BMI distribution over, over time. So, so we see that our results are robust to this. I'll, um, so this particular table is basically telling me about, um, about wealth. So to highlight more on the socioeconomic status and to, to show that rural India the rich and the poor in rural India are experiencing a higher incidence of overweight, but in urban India, the rich are not, but the poor are. And this table basically shows us that, that for rural India, the change or the increase in the overweight incidence has been consistent in all income quantiles. So if I take the poorest 20% or the richest 
20 percent. There has been a roughly four to five uh, percentage points increase in overweight incidence across gender, across wealth quantiles. But in urban India, if you look, we see that urban India, the numbers for say the fifth quantile are insignificant. So that means that the rich in urban India are not likely to experience an increase in overweight BMI. <clears throat> Going forward, we also do a, 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 a significant number of robustness checks. The results are not shown for uh, time constraints, but we do, there may be question who know about OHAGA. We have done non-linear specific instances like Logit and Probit. I've used a different cutoff of BMI instead of 25, 23. That will definitely give me a higher percentage of people. Uh, robust results we have there as well. We have robustness to choice of weight. So OHAGA blinder methodology uses weights. And in our main analysis, we have used NFHS three weights. I have also tried with NFHS four weights. The results are robust. And lastly, we have some missing data. We plug in the averages of missing data and see if our missing covariates are basically kind of they bias the results or they do not bias the results. And we again see that there is no change in our results. So getting to the conclusion of my uh, of this entire paper where we are looking at or trying to see how closely does India follow the nutrition transition or how are we really be, are we also following the same trends as developing countries? So what I would like to say and conclude is that similar to the prediction of the nutrition transition theory, we find that overweight incidence has begun to emerge among lower socioeconomic status groups in India. Rural overweight, rural overweight incidence has increased across the income gradient and urban overweight increase has rapidly increased among those with lower SES only. So, so urban people who are poor are seeing a higher incidence of overweight, not the rich. Furthermore, we see that differences in biological factors and obesogenic factors explain gender and within country differences. So at the individual level, biological factors such as age and reproductive stress are associated with women overweight incidence, but not so for men. We also see that intra-household differences in access to obesogenic technologies explain gender differences. So male overweight prevalence is more closely related to access to motorized vehicle. These vehicles enable greater income generation and are also more likely to be used by men. When technologies are relatively non-excludable within a household, say a television, then women overweight are also impacted as much as men. So at later stages of economic development, like in urban areas, we also have factors like reduction in smoking and increasing watching television also explaining the overweight incidence. So to conclude, my results or our results suggest that, there, that we need a group-based and a community-based approach to stem this increasing incidence of overweight, in, especially in India. For instance, if we look at nutritional education programs, then these programs should include age and gender appropriate counseling services and also account for differences in intra-household access to obesogenic technologies in order to curtail or reduce the overweight risk in India. These counseling needs to be given to young rural women during reproductive health checkups, whereas middle-aged women and those who have completed their fertility are, should, be, should be specifically targeted in urban areas. So the main target population for curtailing this overweight is middle-aged or higher aged women in urban areas, but young women in rural areas. What is needed for rural men is that we need proactive campaigning that, that increases their awareness for, or awareness about the importance of exercising daily so that their overweight prevalence can go down. In rural India, we know there has been farm mechanization. There has been increasing access to bikes and motorbikes and cars which is leading to decrease in calorie expenditure. So we need to have more campaigns about how they can spend more energy, more exercise. For urban men, in fact, we need change in behaviors. For example, we need to have changes in their diet um, uh, because eating out is very more often in urban India. We need to have campaigns that particularly target urban men, not only for their um, gymming or exercising activities, but also in their eating activities. We also need some external policies like food and agriculture policies, which could subsidize the production and consumption of healthy foods. And lastly, we also need increased investments in environmental resources, like we need more uh, public parks uh, that encourage people to exercise, to counter the reduction in physical activity, which is in any way a part of their rising income. We need, we, if there's free gyms across 
we do see in Delhi, I have like uh, in my previous office next to my um, office, there was a park and there was a pub public gym, there was a park gym and I would see that, you know, um, uh, people would just come there in the afternoon during winters and just would be on those machines. So that is quite an incentive for the people. There was another thing I, I heard about was that there was a railway station, I think in Ghazibat or somewhere that had a weighing scale and um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, a squat a scale or something of that sort where if you would get an, a free ticket, a platform ticket, if you would do a, the, that many squats. So, you know, these kind of incentives and policies definitely is a win-win situation for a country like India, where poor people definitely do not have an appetite to spend money in reducing their weight. So that's about it. That's, that's where the policy implications would follow, that the target area needs to be the rural population and rural males particularly. But given that the levels of urban women and men are also high, we need to have policies in place. Yeah. Thank you, Sunaina. I am <laughs> you, you I was unable to mute in between a couple of times, so just raised hand. So but I, I think you'll... I took 15 minutes. Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Yeah, that's, okay. that's fine. Yeah. So open. Okay, we have Abner. Yes, one second. I just so talked. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Avnindra, uh, you can go ahead with yeah, the question. Sure. Yeah. Th thank you. Thank you, Vita. So, Sunana, it was really wonderful uh, presentation. So, okay. So, I'm uh, more, you know, I have a queries and um, I'm having lots of surprises with your, uh, because rural India, you talked about rural India and you talk about the obesity is you know higher Increasing. all across the all across the cl classes basically it's not higher but the rate at which it is increasing it's it's tremendously complex. and all across all class across across all across okay. incomes across genders across yeah okay so what you know earlier when i was uh, i have written one of the paper in which i found a direct relationship between a calorie intake and access to food for instance if somebody is a having land or maybe cow, maybe, you know, poultry farm, maybe, maybe having some kind of in-kind ways. So I found, you know, if same level of income, uh, if, uh, if you compare urban uh, labor and rural labor, if rural labor with the same level of income is having more access to food grain or access to grain, their calorie intake is much higher. Okay. For urban or for rural? For rural. So, because urban, you don't have access to food. They are they are getting wages in cash. But okay. in urban area, in, with the same level of income, if you convert, convert that, you have higher access to food grade because of okay. many reasons. Because you are having some kind of, you know, you are having cow, you are having you know yes, access yes. to some farm product and all. So, that one reason when I found, one, one thing which I found that with the same level of income, if you put a same uh, decide, decide level or some same, uh, you know, group of people, depending on income, the calorie intake is higher for those for rural uh, people India. having, yeah, for rural area for having, if, if they are having higher access to food grain because of one thing. And secondly, you know, so that might be one of the things, but secondly, right. what, yeah, but, but still, uh, still what I find, because I don't know what kind of samples and, uh, it uses, Still, I found with the you know with the, on the basis of NSS data that still a large number of people, rural rural people, are particularly those who are not having access to land or direct access to food, are you know not uh, having adequate calorie intake. Okay. So, so yeah. So so I would say that one thing is I do not have calorie data. I would have really wanted yeah. like per, best mm -hmm. would have been that I had calorie data. But the fact is that. Even if you are poor, you have access to dense calorie food. So if you see the PDS system that we have at the moment, it gives you grains, carbohydrates, okay? And the, the other things like the, in, and there is no variety of food. So that is one reason mm -hmm. why the overweight likelihood. So if I actually had a better version of diet diversity also, I would have seen that those who are having a more balanced or a diversified diet would have a lower incidence of, of being overweight uh, and so if I look ex exactly your sample, then the rural people who are not having access to food grains would because have a lower diet diversity, therefore would be having a higher likelihood of being a high, uh, overweight. So that's, 
impact would be directly linked. Now, what you're basically trying to say is that they're taking less calorie. I don't know what year you have used, but this, what I am seeing is a very recent phenomenon. It's past 10 years, and I'm likely to see a much bigger shoot. So I, I cannot say this till 2005, yeah. 6, but I can only say this from 2005, 6, that there has been a shift. Rural yeah, it was even to 12, 12 uh, 11, 12 uh, last consumption, uh, quinquennial round consumption data we had. And it uh, has been even used with NSS data. It has been found that uh, the calorie consumptions, ca the calorie of rural people are, they continue to be higher compared to the urban Indians. And therefore, that could be a, physical, a very important reason for this increasing BMI. I, I don't see that my results would not be the same if, if I had calorie data. So it's particularly because the time, the time frame that you were looking at is little prior to the time frame mm -hmm. I'm looking at. This is, mm -hmm. has been a transformation that has been a recent phenomenon. Okay, thank you, thank you. Subhran, you uh... Yeah, thank you, Sunaina, for this nice presentation. So uh, I have some a few questions for you. Uh, that the first one is why you are preferring the linear probability model over the non-linear ones? Is there any particular reason? No, no, there's because... no reason. It's only because I want to use my LPM in, in Ohaka and it just eases out my, uh, my okay. interpretation. My results, I have all the results in the paper and appendix. It's just that you're using, you don't have to calculate marginal effects and Ohaka would be becoming more tedious if right. I use Okay. So it would have been like uh, it's the uh, same. Like, I have done logit and yeah, it will be, would be better probably to have one slide showing the similar results coming oh, out from I, the yeah, absolutely so sure, that's sure, just sure. one suggestion. Okay. And uh, when you were running this LPM in table two, yeah. I see, like you have used uh, like socioeconomic status as one variable, or yeah. let's say uh, obesogenic, like, let's say lifestyle choices. Uh, variable like uh, you have used it now i want to ask you like when you are using socioeconomic status in the regression okay yeah so are you using uh, like any index or what exactly yes. goes, so goes basically i am i got it i got it i am actually creating something called so i'm using three variables let me just pull up the slide if i have that Right, I, I, you have so, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, so I am actually using three variables for measuring socioeconomic status, three, no, four. I have caste, I have religion, I have education, I have wealth. So what I'm using is something called a harmonized wealth index. So NFHS will definitely suffer from a problem that the two rounds of wealth, which NFHS will give, are not comparable. So, but if we construct our own index and I use the harmonized wealth index where I pull in my, it's, a, it's an approach when you have over time uh, comparisons, you create an index. Using that index, I create a wealth variable. And in that index, when, I'm, I, when I have this index, I am using a lot of assets that are basically. So it's just like a typical asset index and I'm using a principal component, but it's a harmonized way because I'm going to be recoding my uh, variables across the two rounds, but that does not compress my index. So I use like television, sewing machine, radio, mobile, or cooking, owning farm animals, whether food is cooked in separate rooms. So I use all these variables, kind of reduce their dimension using principal component. But with, the, with, that, with, with this particularly harmonized wealth index, I have the ability to compare the two rounds. So that's why I've used this socioeconomic status, like wealth particular. We don't have income variable in the NFHS. Right. So I have used these variables separately. And what OHAKA allows me to do is, if you see, I did show some results, like it's not feasible to show all the results, but uh, something that's I wanted fine. to show you. For example, uh, this particular, if you look at like obesogenic factors, I can look at the individual contribution as well as the contribution like 12.19, which is the sum of all these contributions together. So do you see what I'm saying? I can have in, in Ohaka, I can aggregate, combine, I can make combinations, multiple linear combinations. So it allows me to give me the total contribution of say diet, which is only 0.2% and only significant for rural women. But I, from this 12.19, I don't know how much diet is. So I can disaggregate it. 
but they mean that they are individually. It's a linear. Uh, so I have a linear. It's a linear regression I have. I have for my um, for each round. I do a simple linear regression. I can do a logit or a probit, and each factors come individually. Each of these social economic factors. I have not reduced the dimension further by combining caste, education, wealth, and education. Um, caste, religion, education, and wealth together. Like I have four different indicators that together capture social economic status. Okay, and final question is: You have mentioned about urban rich and urban poor. Yes. So right. this uh, HW. What was your patient? Yeah. So basically, urban rich and poor is basically using these. Uh, so when I construct my wealth index, the harmonized wealth index, I can not only compare between 2005 and 6 and 15, 16. I can also compare between urban rural. Okay. So what I've done is I have used my wealth index to divide the entire population into five quintiles. So so 20%. First 20 is the lowest, poorest people. So based on the index I have constructed, I am dividing my population or my sample into 20% of each, but five samples separately. I mm -hmm. run the regression separately. So I have for rural India separately and urban India separately. So like that means first, anyway, I have a different rural sample and an urban sample. So first I have a rural sample and an urban sample, men and women also separately. Suppose I have only rural women, I take their asset index, take all the rural women, divide into five equal quantiles and look at the coefficients at every quantile. Okay? okay. So I can do this comparison because it's a harmonized wealth index. Mm. So, so I have basically taken all rural Indian women, use their asset index, divided that asset index or that sample of rural women into five equal uh, right. quantiles and run separate regressions. Separate regressions. Okay. Separate regressions. Yeah, yeah. separate regressions. Yeah, so, so that means if you divide, there are five, five groups, right? Yes, five rural women group, five rural men group, five urban right. women group, five urban men group. Yes. So I'm just trying to figure out, like when you are saying it's a poor, a, let's say an urban poor woman. So yes. which, which portion of your data gets into the uh, let's say the uh, so system. it's that proportion of the sample which has the lowest uh, asset index value okay lowest for asset yes. okay, okay so i am comparing as per my asset index i it's relative right so if i am so asset index is a continuous variable when mm -hmm. i have a continuous variable i can i can arrange it in an ascending order i did that then right. I said, okay, the lowest 20% and the highest 20%, for example. So the lowest mm -hmm. will be the poorest category and okay, the highest will be the richest category. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Vittiman, yeah. yeah. he has his hand. Vittiman, you hi. can go ahead with your question. Uh, yes. Hi, hi Sanana. Uh, hi, thank, man. You, thank you for this opportunity. It's a wonderful presentation. I actually don't have questions, but I have a few comments that you may choose to ponder on. Okay. Uh, so first uh, is you'd mentioned about smoking and obesity. Mm -hmm. So while, while there is evidence how nicotine suppresses uh, appetite. appetite, right? But mm -hmm. I don't know if uh, maybe it would be best if it could be, it's just my personal opinion, uh, that if it could be phrased in a different way, because now it's sounding like you need to smoke to, you know, lose weight. Oh, okay. I get it. I get it. No, yes. actually, the, the good thing is that smoking has gone down in India and that's causing, which is a good behavior change. So that's right. what I wanted to highlight. It's the proportion the second, of people who are consuming smoking has gone down. Has gone yeah. down. Okay. So, uh, Among the, men. okay. So the next point I wanted to share was about, uh, I see there was a statistically significant results in terms of women um a post uh, 45 plus so basically we can bring about how post menopausal women yeah and obesity is uh, related we can bring yes. that yes yeah, so that's basically that's what so that's basically the age thing that's being captured if you see this right uh, right i have that slide here yeah so i yeah so basically it's the um <coughs> women and especially urban women in this age group because of the increasing menopausal issues also because of many right. things, because of lower activities as well as because of their diets, that there are more issues that come for women. And that's being 
that's being seen in this particular significance. So I'll take your point. I'd rather see it that way, that it's the menopausal women that. Okay, thank you. Uh, a couple of more. So yes. maybe, maybe through, through this study, it could also be uh, commented on how if, if the government NCD, uh, the NCD structure in the government health system, is it prepared to actually handle uh, rising rural? Absolutely, uh, absolutely. And we have seen one, we're well, not an NCD related thing, but a COVID related a pandemic. And we could see that the infrastructure did collapse at some point, right. so absolutely, right. yeah. Another thing that can we have some more disruptive policy uh, decisions? Something like, uh, can we ban mm -hmm. certain I, I'm just curious, can we ban certain products? Right. Or... So I would say that comes, yeah. um, so, so do you mean to say alcohol and smoke? Are you going in that direction? No, 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 no I'm not going in that direction. But can we, let's say first, it needs to be understood what are some of the uh, primary triggers. It may not be just alcohol and smoking, um, but what to what percentage is alcohol actually contributing to obesity? Or right now, it, nothing. In our sample, the data right. what we have, right. nothing. Probably because there's underreporting also. Right. Or or, or in terms of uh, in terms of responsible consumption and responsible behavior from the uh, people's perspective, uh, why can't we have policies? Something like you know, because since it is since obesity is related to sedentary work culture, let me know it now. Yes. So why can't we have things incorporated into performance appraisal mechanisms? How you know uh, how your physical health would also count into you know let's say performance appraisals in mm. the places where you work. I'm just I'm just uh, <laughs> uh, or. Yeah, and lastly, I think uh, a doer, non-doer study kind of study, uh, especially in terms of the rural rising obesity. Um, Come again? It, do, do, um, it, it, it's called a doer, non-doer analysis. Okay, uh, okay, okay, okay. Qualitative okay. analysis, they have frameworks available. I think that kind of a study on how, why the rural has a rising, I mean, why we already understand why some of the reasons, but there could be so many more. Other reasons, I see, yes, well, that we, yeah. That's a nice suggestion. Thanks, Rutman. That's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Hi, I had, I... A, I had a couple of uh, questions for you. Uh, so the first one is, uh, I don't think there's an answer to it per se, but I just, I'm still a little like uh, the, the causal mechanism. I mean, the idea that in rural areas, uh, you have, basically you have you don't have access to gyms basically, whereas in urban areas or in rich houses, you have access to trade mills. And that, I'm still wrapping my head around this. I mean, I would so, think- So, Super, she like, just want to flag second, first, for this is not a, a causal second. paper. I should have highlighted, this is not a causal. Right now, we don't even have associational paper. So this is a, I would say it's a, it's a great, I personally have written, this is a great understanding about obesity trends and pattern in India. We do need more data to, to have more causal studies. Yes, so, yes. Uh, no, so I was just, so yeah, so I understand. So just, okay, this is a couple of points. Uh, one yeah. of them being that uh, I would expect life for women to be very hard in say hilly areas and, you know, uh, tougher terrains and things like that. Do you have any sort of controls for geography and things like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, the state of resident, uh, like I don't, the state of residence, the macro environment. So um, one, I'll just quickly just show you uh, okay, so we do have uh, states, we have classified states based on, uh, like these are the kind of classification I've used. I've used low agricultural productivity, high agricultural productivity, rapidly transforming states and hilly states. So so we are- the Hilly states, was it? Sorry, yeah. oh, hilly. Hilly, hilly. So we have okay. these four, you know, categories of states and we have this control for the macro environment. Right now, I do not, I, you know, I don't have the result in front of me showing you the lab hap RTS contribution, but it's probably that developed states are now showing better or lower increase in uh, overweight incidence, at least in urban areas, as, and hilly as states? proposed by the nutrition transition. Totally. And hilly states? Hilly states? Hilly, state? hilly states anyway have a better one because, so I would say low agricultural productivity have the worst or the most uh, increase 
uh, in overweight incidence. Uh, hilly is actually because of the terrain, because of their walking um, yeah, activity yeah. level. They are yeah. not that prone to uh, being overweight in okay. general. But again, okay. there would be variations within that. Okay, so that's something I was just, just trying to wrap yeah. it on my head around the... Yeah, I, you know, I have that in the paper, the, so I can give you my... I'll, I'll just say... Just yeah, no, no, that. that's, fine. that's fine. I mean, you just answered yes. by me. That that was pretty yes, much, you know, just, I just wanted those. to know a little bit about the, the, the terrain so, effects and so on. Yeah. So, basically so let, me say, let, me, uh, let me say I buy your argument. Uh, let me hit this from a perspective of a political scientist and bring the state into the picture. Do okay. you have stuff in there about... Uh, welfare programs, incidents of welfare programs, uh, how no, much uh, no, per household, no. how much, you know, no. because uh, there is an, and I think this is where you can do, I think, good work, I mean, extend this, because there's a very interesting literature that says that uh, because of the state's heavy presence uh, in rural India, uh, in rural India, right, through a variety of uh, welfare programs and so on, uh, you are sort of, this is an argument made by an anthropologist, Partho Chatterjee, a political scientist. So he says that because you have the state present in such a big way, mm -hmm. uh, you're kind of thwarting uh, the transition to a fully industrialized society because, you know, the classic argument being that you have industrialization, people move from agriculture to uh, the, you to know, uh, to the cities yes. and, 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 and so on, and everything is nice and, you know, everybody's, uh, it's good. And then wages rise in agriculture, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but if you're stopping that, uh, so by, by the state intervening in such a huge way, you're sort of stopping that dynamic. And I wonder if some of these things that you're finding is, is somehow related to that. Uh, it's just something I think. Yes, uh, I, that's, so that's, that's the caveat. We do not have a lot of data on these welfare schemes or stuff like that, but that's something I would definitely read on. And probably if I can extend this analysis, I would love to. Because, you know, I can assure you that will be a great contribution. Could you please just forward me the paper? I'll, 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 it'll be a fantastic, uh, you know, fantastic Thanks, contribution. Jeff. Thank and, you. and then the last question, I know, I mean, I know, you know, I mean, this is how economists do this. You know, this data set very well. And that's why you can do a lot of these nice uh, econometrics and so on. My question is comparable studies in other countries. What sort of effects have they found? So How would your effects compare so to this? I would say we are basically, so, so that's what we are trying to say, what has been shown for developed countries and yeah. the issues that they are facing, even developing countries are facing the same. And if I say, if I talk about Indian rural poor and compare mm. them with, with American rural poor, so it's not the same, right, in any sense. So this is what we are trying to say that we do have issues, we do have these problems, and these are not problem, and they are they're going to have even more adverse effects. So they need to be controlled for. So our results are actually following what the developed countries are actually showing. So it's the mm. same. And so this is the transformation. We are having a structural transformation, but along with the structural transformation, we are having this very we are having this sooner than later. So in in initial developed countries, the rural uh, or poor did witness overweight increase, but that came after a quite a quite a long time. Whereas in India, it's come early. So do we, 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 we need to figure this out. Otherwise, we will have a, we have, we have a big burden coming away. We need to figure that sure, out. Sure, sure. I guess so my question what, is, has studies like this been done in, say, Bangladesh or, you know, what we would con, uh, consider? So they are sort of more, more or less, more or less, there are studies for developed countries. Ah, so this is kind of a new thing. So this is so a that new is thing. why we try to bring the model. So the 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 novel the the thing about this paper is not just the decomposition. See, most more or less all papers are doing that, but mm. it's also about the way we had modeled this this you know borrowing it from Popkins from the developed state, borrowing it from Swinburne at all, and then trying to show it from the angle of a developing country. So that's why you know this paper tries to flesh out. What are the problems that developing countries, especially for us, for India, faces? And okay. since this is a DHS data demographic and health survey, this is something like that's the plan that we are going to be doing a, you know, global study with demographic health survey available for many other countries. We can bring them here and see whether the same results or same patterns are seen or not. My hint is Good. that yes, India has is giving a classic. So we can say that. Poorer states in India are comparable to Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we have developed states, you know, so we, uh, so other countries should be 
looking into this model and taking out policies accordingly because even if they have not had this rural men or a rural uh, uh, incidence of overweight going up it's going to come there sooner so okay. it's better to buckle up like that's the kind of okay good uh, stuff good stuff very good thank, thank you. you thank you thank i'll you. share the paper with you okay the one Thanks. i was talking about. um i don't see a question uh, from the dean also um yeah it's more uh, of a suggestion put my hands down. Yeah, I think he's left. Okay, so it says if any, the previous subsidy for we has altered diet habits of poor people mostly in rural India, and whether this shows a relationship between obesity. I think that's something we can do from the NSS data. Maybe uh, in the sense of medicine, I have people working on the PDF. Oh, that's a that's that's a welfare kind of question, right? Yes. Yeah. So I have a person um, in my. Ex office that he's particularly working on PDS and so social safety nets. Yeah, yeah. And looking yeah. at the link. Yeah. Right, right. Good stuff. Thank you. I think no more questions from anyone. Thank you. Thank you, Sunaina, for thank an you excellent. So thank, thank, you. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, very everybody. Nice. Very, nice very nice talk. Yeah. Thank you. Really thank enjoyed you. it. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, nice, nice. Bye bye.